Hello, everyone. We are here with the amazing Susan Harrow, who is an incredible publicist. And she has 33 years of experience working with people, helping them get on amazing spots in the media, in on TV, on radio, on print, on podcasts, you name it. She has done it, including on stages. She's helped people get onto Oprah and uh, American, what is it? It's called um, Good Morning America, Vanity Fair, all these different places. And so today she is going to be telling us her secrets so that we can start implementing and, um, and getting more media for ourselves, for our businesses. So welcome to the show, Susan. Thank you. I'm so thrilled to be here. And I was a publicist and now I do the media training. So I prep you for that. And I usually work with PR firms or marketing departments, or if you have your assistant, that they book you and then I prep you for all of that so that when you have a media appearance, it really has an effect on your business and brand and it drives business in the direction that you want. Perfect. And that's exactly what we want. We have women who are in our group who are launching books, who are, we have one woman who just got, she runs triathlon. She, she mm -hmm. hosts the whole thing. She just got chosen to partner with America's cup and now she's going for world cup. So there's big PR opportunities, uh, but we have all kinds of amazing women. And I understand the value of getting on the media and having the right message. So that's what we really want to dive into today so that we have more tools in our pocket so that we can go out and, um, and create bigger brands for our, for our businesses. So I want you to talk first about the mindset that you need to have before you approach the media. Can you go into that a bit for us? There was this uh, giant Buddha, almost six feet tall and 5.5 .5 tons in Thailand. And up the monastery where it resided was moving. And so they had to move this giant Buddha and it was covered in clay or mud. And when they started moving it, one monk noticed, oh, there was like a chip in the mm -hmm. Buddha. And he saw that there was some gold shining through. And when they then once they started chiseling the Buddha and all of the mud and clay fell away and underneath was a solid gold Buddha of two worth two hundred and fifty million dollars. And I say I think that we are like that golden Buddha where we begin golden in a, as we're born and then we most of us cover our our light and our gold. And I see my job to have you shine in the media spotlight is to get back to that original goldenness that you are and that connecting how you are at your essence with what you have to offer for the media. That was such a beautiful story. So, you know, how do we do that? How and it looks like Stacy knew that story. Did you know that story, Stacy? I, I have yeah. heard that story before. So it's it's yeah. exciting to hear it, but I love how you put it into perspective of us. So, <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that I hear from my clients is I can see their brilliance when I talk to them that, you know, I'm like, oh my God, we have a woman who's here today who has a PhD. And I remember her saying, mm -hmm. you know, Midori, I'm not an entrepreneur. I, you know, I've been teaching forever and I'm like, okay, but yeah, remember you have that PhD thing. And so she just... And then we have another woman who's in our group and I don't want to call anyone out, but she <laughs> has this amazing talent and, and creativity. And, um, she, she's from the Midwest and she talks about getting, um, you know, sitting around a table and, um, you know, bringing people together and it, and it makes us all go back in our mind and think, oh my gosh, yeah, I remember that. I remember sitting there with my grandma for hours and with our family and, and those good feelings that we had. However, they don't see it for themselves. So Susan, can you share some tips on how to pull that out or how to help people recognize their, their gold shiny um, areas of themselves and how to spotlight those? I, I heard the saying that, um, you know, a wish that we women have is, um, could I please have the confidence of a mediocre man? 
<laughs> oh, that's amazing. Yes. And yeah, most of us, I think, down we're, we're taught to downplay who we are and our brilliance. And and for your PhDs and your experience, I think we we, we want to look at a number of things. We want to look at our our experience, our our experience. We want to look at our skill set. We want to look at our knowledge, and then really put those into the context of what our offer is and then how that relates to what the media needs or what's going on in the culture today. Because to to be a valuable um, source for the media, it needs to connect in that way. So if we can start to look at like, where does my experience serve others? Because we're really great at serving others, right? Like, so we, instead of saying like, oh, what am I and how diminished I am, sort of flip the switch and say, how can I use what I have for the benefit of all beings, right? I mean, in the big picture, it's that. And one of my um, dear friends, when I was talking, she had just done the whole Tony Robbins thing. And she said, I do these, they're not affirmations, but she does these um, sort of more incantations. And she told me one of her incantations that I sort of switched to be mine is, can I express my magic every day? And I want to expand that to say, can I express the magic in me every day for the benefit of all beings? And if we start to look at it more in that bigger perspective, and then really evaluate um, what, because what the media wants is they want you to be an expert in authority or a thought leader in something. So if we start to look at our background and connect our past to like, look at your whole background. The reason why I gave you all that signature story document is one of the one of the formats or templates. It's not the only one, but one of it is like, how did your past inform what you do today? It may not be, it may not go all the way back to your childhood. It may be um, a striking experience. It may be an aha moment. It may be just a gap in the in the marketplace. But as we start to look at it in that focus and in that lens, I think then we we sort of shift the whole perspective of our, I don't even want to say our value or our worth, but our a perspective of um, ourselves in that way and not look at it so personally like, who am I to do that? But more, what can I do with the gifts that I've been given? Yes. So with that, so building on what you're talking about, is there a way that you can frame it so that it's media? So it's more, me, uh, the media is more interested in it, right? Because that's what I always hear is you, you have to have a, something that's compelling for the media. Everyone has some type of story, but how can, is there, are there tricks to help make it more media um, interesting? Yes. Number one is to put it in the negative. <laughs> and, and this, and the reason why we do this, I mean, really the three hot hooks, um, and that's a framework too. I'll go into that in a second, but to put it in the negative, because the way our brains work is we're more attuned to the negative than the positive. That's just neuroscience. So you put it in the negative first, and then you shift it to the positive. So you look for the problems or the gap and where you can fill that in. And then that headline is something that's got to be dramatic or surprising or curious or weird to capture. And that's in the and that's in the subject line of your email. That's also the headline. And really now we're in an age where we're doing like a paragraph pitch. You don't we you just want to tease the media. And then when they come to you for more, you want to have your press release and your uh, pitch letter and you want to have a press kit already and your photos, you want to have everything ready. And we can talk about that later if if that's something that we we want to go through. Like what do you need to have ready? But the first thing is to have that that striking headline. Um, and in the negative. So some kind of problem that you solve. So the three hot hooks would be what's the problem that you solve that you have a solution to? That would be one formula. Number two is is there a myth that you can debunk? And a myth, um, I like to even, even there's even three ways for the myth. Do you, is there a myth that you agree with? Is there a myth that you disagree with? Or is there a new, um, something new or a new trend that you, that you see arising that you can point out or that you are a leader in? So we look at the trends and the topics. And then the third thing, and you really need to be super prepared to do this one, but it's like, what kind of controversy 
can you can you stir up some kind of controversy? Do you have a an opinion that goes against the grain? But you have to be really ready for that kind of thing because that can get really dramatic and scary, but also it's very exciting and the media loves that. So those are, are those are the three main ways. And I did create a document with a, I love that you're, was that a dog or a cat? I saw somebody it's, just wander by. I just saw the side of a cat. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw the cat, um, the star of the show. Um, what you want to do is now there's AI programs that can help you with your headline. And so I created a document um, called prsecrets.com. That's my website forward slash Midori, Midori, right? And in the in that document, you will have one, uh, a couple, I think I gave like three options for headline creators. So you can test your headlines in there. So it's really fantastic. You already know about that. Um, Linus, is it Lin Linnae? Linnae. 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 It's Linnae and Midori has, uh, has helped me with some headline generation. So um, I know it through Midori. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a great tool. I've been testing it for all kinds of, um, all kinds of things. And it's really interesting when you start to try these combinations that can be like super helpful because I think that like what you said, we don't see our own genius. We'll put it into there and it's going to show you what's working and what's not. And then you can, and then you can use that. So I think it takes some of the onus off. Um, so to back up a little bit though, what we really want to look at is how, what you do and what you know and who you are connects with what the media wants, what's going on in the culture today. So you do want to be familiar with the headlines and what's happening so you can make it current. And we can make something current with statistics, with studies, with uh, evaluations from your own experience with your own clients and customers. So that's just as valid as well. So I know- Did I answer the question? You did, yes. That was, did I? Okay. That was a very, yes, absolutely. So, you know, if we're going for, there's a, there's a different way to approach a TV show, right? You know, you and I, Susan, are, are in the Bay Area. And so, you know, I've been on CBS San Francisco a couple of times, um, but that was quick, right? Super. So what I sent to them was different than what I would send to like a magazine or a newspaper. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, and how we approach those different media um, outlets. Yeah, so it is a different approach and I would wait to do TV last and do your local TV first to get the experience before you start to approach national because it is very compressed and pressure cooked. Uh, so you wanna start smaller. So I would start with podcasts first and just get, because there's more latitude, I mean, they're anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour, right? And you can start to get practice and you can start to see, get your chops down with podcasts. So pitching a podcast, and this goes the same for the media. First, if you don't have a list or whatever, you want to research the person and um, and their beat, which would be, you know, business or wellness or whatever genre you're in. And then you want to listen to that podcast to get the, the sense of it. And then when you you want to, when you're approaching or you're pitching them, you would put what your topic would be in that headline, your hook. And then to them, you would make a sincere compliment, what you loved about the, the, uh, the, the episode that you listened to. And then share just super briefly what it is that you could offer that you think connects with their audience. And what I recommend first is to look through all of the guests that they've had. So first of all, they have to have guests. Like some people just do podcasts solo, but you look through to make sure that they have, haven't had a guest on that's similar to you. And even if they did, could you do a twist on that topic? And you would listen to that episode and say, this person covered that. And I think I can cover, you're obviously interested in that topic and I can cover it in this way. Or you're proposing something that you think that their audience would appreciate. And then you you send that. And what I didn't realize, Majori, I mean, just this is just the same as media, but I was sort of mortified. I was just on a podcast yesterday. It was a half an hour. And the guy, uh, the host mentioned to me, he goes, yeah, you know, your publicist, I have a booker, uh, your publicist must have emailed me 20 times. I'm thinking, what? I'm like, 20 times to get me on the show? I thought it was like one time he said yes. And I'm 
you know, on it. And yeah, and I had to book, you know, it's months in advance. I booked them last year, you know, because he had already most podcasts, you know, book three to the most popular ones book a month to three months out right and then they and then by the time it gets aired it might be a, a couple months later as well um but I, I shouldn't have been floored because I was a publicist first to know how many connects there were but I was and you know and then I Plenty. Wrote, that's a lot Plenty. and yeah and and the other thing that he had said to me is you know you can't imagine how many pitches I get that are not relevant to me you know, so so this is the same with the media. Their biggest complaint and the biggest complaint of podcast people is that it's not personalized to them. So we are now in an age where you can't do any blast blasts. You really need to personalize. It's a lot of work. I I I, I I'm doing you know a whole podcast campaign, Majora. You know that, yeah. and and it's an f load of work. <laughs> to listen, to make the compliment. And then I have to do the specific pitch, even though I've got a one sheet, I kind of tweak each topic, even though I've got that one sheet to the specific podcaster based on um, what I've seen. And that's been really successful. Uh, yeah. And, and I agree. It's, yeah. uh, I have a spreadsheet and so I tweak it based on what, yeah what the podcast is and what You're I listen to. You're very organized with your spreadsheet. I leave that to my... Oh, no, it makes it so <laughs> much easier. Which I love. Yeah, yeah, I have my assistant who helps me with it. Um, yeah. But I want it's to... Sort of the same process too. Like if you're going to even pitch a journalist or whatever, you need to look at their beat. You know, you need to look at um, what they've covered, what they do. And, you know, um, because I think that's much... I, I think that will create much more success for you, even if you get fewer media placements they'll be better for you versus trying to generalize it. So it's the same thing. I would say it's the same thing for print. I would go through that same process. And then for a broadcast or, you know, TV, you're going to be watching the show. You're going to get a sense of the host and how many hosts there are, right? And then your pitch is more going to be, it's still going to be the topic. And then when they respond back, what they're going to ask you for and what, you know, publicists do is they're like, here are the, here's the main point. Here are the five questions to ask me. And sometimes you actually have to list the talking points, like what you're going to answer. And then here's the B-roll or background footage, which is the video or the stills or the, the book or, you know, whatever the images are. Um, so you want the back, the background footage or B-roll. And then you want to think about props because it's a visual media medium. How can I tell a story through something phys physical or tactile that can further me along because I only have two or four minutes. Okay, wait. So when you talk about B-roll, so when we're going out and we're we're asking to be on a TV show, I believe that's, that's where you yeah. were referring to it. We include B-roll for them? Is that what you're saying? No, we, we, we describe the B-roll. Okay. So we would say, um, I, I, here's my, you know, here's my topic. And then you would say, um, here's how I would support it. I have B-roll that would show me, um, like with my, uh, an old client of mine, Rich Fetke, who wrote Extreme Success, mm -hmm. one of the things that he did um, in his book, you know, sold for six figures, and then he got tons of media. And one of the things, he was a, an Olympic bungee jumper. So part of the B-roll that we had is he was in a business suit and he did a bungee jump in his business suit. And everybody loved. You can imagine how much, how many <laughs> TV shows used him jumping off of a cliff in his business suit because part of his his um, the way he worked with clients is to overcome their blocks or their fears would be to take them climbing, bungee jumping, oh, climb. climbing. Okay. Not all of them had to do the bungee jump, but they did a climb. But that was part of the B roll. So we would have said, you know, he, the B roll is. Um, rich in a suit, jumping off of uh, a cliff, bungee jumping. Or, okay, uh, so there's there's a number of things that you just talked about that I want to unpack. One, I want to define what B-roll is. Some people don't know. So B-roll is kind of that um, that video that plays. It might be you. It might be someone else. It's it's like in movies, they, they always have a B-roll of um, some random people that are doing something. So that's, yeah. that's kind of yes, what B-roll yes, yes. is. Yeah. Um, for that is not a great explanation, but hopefully it makes it clear. But then also, I want to talk about, you talked about how he, <laughs> that is amazing. He's wearing a suit. He did a bungee jump. That's creating news for yourself. 
So that's where I want to go with this, Susan. What are some ideas on how we can create newsworthy buzz for ourselves? Yes, we can go, you know, I could go off in a prom dress, jumping off a ledge um, and probably get some news. I also would probably freak out, but you know, what, what are some ideas there? Because it's very difficult to cut through the noise. So let's say we've been doing all the podcasts We've gotten on on some radio shows, but now we're ready for something a little bit bigger, or we have a big book coming out and we want to create a huge buzz. Yeah. What are some creative ways that you've helped your clients? You so know? I always I'm always thinking about this. Like even um, you know, so I'll I'll give you two examples. So one, my um client um who sadly passed away, Debbie Ford, but you probably know her for her shadow work. So I media trained her for her last. Um, book. And it was about, you know, how much, you know, revealing our dark sides, dealing, dealing with our dark side. And it was talking about um, the baggage that we carry that weighs us down, that doesn't allow us to have a, a bright future. So what we conceived of is, okay, she was doing a national tour. It was before COVID, right? Because so she was doing a physical tour. And we said, what would be easy to take with her? We could have had a backpack, but what we decided on was one of those gigantic yoga balls. And so she brought onto the show this giant yoga ball and said, this is what we're all walking around with. How easy it is, is it to move with this? Mm. You know? And so that visually showed you know, the kind of emotional baggage that we had at that time, then what happened, you know, which was fortuitous and sad was the Elliot Spitzer drama where he was having sex in the bathroom and talking about his demons and his big ball that he carried around that he was like railing against homosexuality when he was a homosexual. So we got to be able to tie into the news during her tour. That was fortuitous, but just talking about the emotional baggage, which we all have, you know, we could relate that if she were touring, book touring today, we could relate that to what's going on with quiet quitting. And we could relate that today to people really looking at what they want to do with their lives and the jobs that they want that are more meaningful. And what kind of things do they have to lose to be able to move forward for their own happiness? So we could we could tie that into today. Um, another example is one of my clients who's a, um, she is a, a telehealth evangelist. She's a doctor with a uh, 50 uh, licenses in all 50 states, which is hugely unusual. <clears throat> and she was on a show for, it was Women's Health Week. And so we were talking about what is the B-roll or background footage that you supply. So it's either video or stills typically, or written words. So in Debbie Ford's case, I don't remember if we did like five steps, but that's super common to be able to do, um, you know, um, you're going to cover five points and they put the five points up there, which is to your advantage because they have to move you through all five. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to be very quick about it and really practice and role play. And that's what we do in media training. Like, can you move through those five points? Even if the hosts host or hosts are talking, you know, how quickly can you get to those? And when can you give an example? When can you tell a quick story? When can you use statistics? and keep within your time frame, And so we have to practice that and time that out so you can get through all five. And we, we usually put them in an order that's most important so you can cover the things that are most important to you. Now, do they always ask them in that order? No, but if they've got them up on the screen, yes. So that's how we plan and really shape a segment ahead of time. That's how you can have influence to do that. And when you do all the work, when you say, I'll provide the B-roll, I'll bring the props, then you start to create and shape the perspective of your business and brand much more consciously, because then they're much less apt. You've done the work. And now with everything that's gone on in the news industry, they even have less resources. So the more work you do in every aspect, the better it is for you. So we do all of the work for them. I love the concept of even bringing in a prop. I never thought, you know, other than a book, yeah, yeah. you know, I've seen it where they show the book, but you yeah. know, just, just all of that is such a um, eye opener. Linnea has a question here. 
how, how might I bridge the gap between what organizations know and what I can tell them about shadow? So she does shadow work in organizations, oh, oh, oh. Um, which is a word they don't know. Yeah, they don't know that. I'm sure. Yeah. So frame it in, in words that they do know, like um, how alcoholism or absenteeism is, is affecting their ROI. What's underneath that? So I would go for the ROI because that's what they're most concerned with. And then back it up to like, and there are some great statistics because I had a client who was um, talking about, um, I can't remember the stat now, but it's gone. I got the new stat, but it was like how much business they're losing because of um, absenteeism due due to some sort of uh, drug abuse or mm. I don't know what the proper term is now, but some sort of um, addiction. Substance. I mean, just okay. some sort of addiction. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's enormous. Wow. You know, it's, it's, it's in the billions, you know, and each company loses. Yeah. And especially, gosh, especially now with COVID, like, I mean, people are staying home and drinking, right. Or, <laughs> or whatever, because they've got the kids and they've got the stress and they've got, so I think it's, it's super relevant now. Does that, does, is that helpful? Okay, good. Great. Um, Very helpful. And if you like, do you happen to know what that source is? Because I have been um, like sort of looking for like where to find those sorts of stats. A lot of great, a lot of great stats is census.gov, but ping me because I have it because okay. I put it in one of my other talks, but I don't have it at my fingertips, do that. but I did re-research it to up it. Yeah. That's <laughs> it was, fantastic. It was, yeah. 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 So just, okay. Me. So let's talk about some of them myths and about getting publicity you know, we, we have, we've talked about podcasting and TV. What are some, what are some of the biggest myths that many of us believe? So the biggest myth is that you can just wing it. <laughs> that I'm just so dynamic that I'm going to get out there and they're all going to love me. Is yes. that what you're saying? <laughs> especially speakers, especially people who are used to commanding the stage or who are used to running meetings. They think they're just going to go out there and, and do it. And, and it's so different being, in, in a back and forth situation where the only person that you have control over is yourself. So you're not, you know, running the energy in the room. You're not managing the people in your workshops. Um, it is, you are just managing yourself in a situation where every, anything technical can go wrong and they can ask you any kind of question in any order or ask you surprise questions. So one of the things that we do first is we look at like, what is your worst case scenarios? Like, what are the things you don't want to be asked? What are you, what are your emotional triggers? So we can really look at those kinds of things in the context of what you want to present. And then we go through role play, which is we start really lovely and nice and just back and forth. And then we ramp up to the speed of media, which is very, very fast. So we, you want to get the practice in and then being under pressure. And I can tell you from working with, you know, hundreds and thousands of clients, it's like we can have a perfect role play, right? And then um, and then, then, then the real thing happens and people are going like, oh my God, everything went to hell in a handbasket because it takes an enormous amount of practice to maintain your equanimity and center and to stay on message. And even when, you know, even when you've practiced, um, there are some techniques to get back to center when you've been thrown off center. So the idea is not to think about, oh, I'm always going to be on center. It's like, no, assume you're going to be thrown off center and know how to get back and know how to transition to your points. It's such a key point. It's, you know, I've, I've been on a lot of podcasts. I've been on a lot of podcasts. So I feel, feel like, you know, I've been yeah. on so many, so it'll be no problem. And I know that we should know what our sound bites are, which I do want to talk about, um, and you know our key message. But then they ask something that has nothing to do with anything that you're doing, and we there's ways, there's tricks to kind of get them back to you know take control again of what the message is. However, that can throw off the whole damn thing. So <laughs> I I agree totally. with you. You have to be prepared. So before and to we use a, you and to use transition phrases and one that you can use that will always save your skin is I don't know about that. And what I do know is, so if somebody says something completely off the wall, you know, I just made jumbo. I just made, you know, I just was cooking all morning and I was making this stuff and it didn't turn out right. And I don't know what went wrong. <laughs> and you're like, 
Okay. Yeah. You know, a lot, I, I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of things can go wrong in a media interview. And the first thing is, and then you just transition yeah. to that. <laughs> and not Did only hear that? I'm making a jumbo, but in every, you know, so, so that's the kind of agility that we're asking you to start to, to develop. Yeah. And I think yeah. also getting back to the, where you said, you know, I'm, I was talking about TV and you're like, well, let's start with podcasting because podcasting is a great place to practice, right? Yes. There's so many of them out there. And so it does take experience. You, the way that you just explained that was so, um, you know, it was just so beautiful and ele- elegant, right? But it yeah. takes practice it takes to practice. do that, to know how to circle back around so that it's yeah. not this sharp turn. And it sounds awkward. So let's talk about, before we even get into the media, we need some content. You mentioned it earlier in this, in in this talk, what are, what are the three things that we need to have in place before we're even ready to go out? So you want your positioning, which is um, where you are in, in the marketplace. You want proof. That's your, uh, your expertise, like why you're an expert in what you do. And the last thing is, is preparation is like preparing, you know, all of that into a context. And and those and within that context when we're talking about messaging, typically the key kind of messaging strategy that you want for yourself are um, you want to have your signature story, why you do what you do, because that's going to be the first question that pretty much everybody asks you. Some podcasts are more focused on that too, like they say tell us a little bit about your background. It's in every kind of, you know, way, shape, or form. Tell us how you got to where you are. Tell us about your background. Why are you, why did you write your book? Why do you start your business? And then the next thing is, so be prepared for that one for sure. And, and some of that can really lay the groundwork to what you want to talk about. So it does, why you do what you do really needs to connect with what your offer is that you're going to be weaving in gracefully with ease into the conversation. And then the next thing is you want to have some success stories that are that from your clients and your customers. How have you helped other people in some way, shape, or form? Right? So it, it needs to be woven into that. So an example might be so my um, telehealth doctor, she was getting, she had a PR firm and she was getting tons of media, but um, she said, I don't know what I'm doing because um, she didn't have her intentionality down. The first thing we worked on is what is your intention? She wants, I want to promote telehealth and have it be available to everyone. I'm like, well, I'm not hearing that in your interviews. She's like, well, they're not asking me those questions. I'm like, so what? You know? And so any interview that she does, even if it was talking about baby sunscreen, like should you sunscreen for your baby? needs to be woven in. What if your baby does get burned and you don't have access to a doctor, right? We can transition to how, how, what are some resources in the telehealth that you can, you can take care of your baby without leaving your home, right? So in every single interview, we want to get a point in there about telehealth, even if it's a topic of baby sunscreen. And that's about being super intentional. It's not being salesy. Mm -hmm. It's being like, for her, it was really about um, she wasn't selling anything. I mean, yes, people can hire her to be a doctor, their doctor and, and, you know, use her for women's health. And she has, a, you know, organizations and startups that she's a part of. But that's also what we wanted to weave into the conversation that she connects and advises startups. So we want to have that woven into the conversation as well. So we really worked on that too, no matter what the topic was, so we could open it up. So if a startup is listening and they're in the medical or wellness industry, they knew that they could hire her as a consultant. So we had a multiple agenda of intentions that we were layering in there that she wanted. Now, can you get every single one in every single interview? No, of course not. But we we take the priority and we take what's going to be organic to that interview and weave it in. Right. So it would be a story about how a startup used her advice to solve some sort of solution or or some great, great thing that she, um, you know, sometimes it's about the bottom line, how she increased the bottom line. Sometimes it's about putting a new uh, drug or invention out into the uh, into the culture. Right. So whatever that is, whatever that result is, want to talk about that. So your customers and your clients, what kind of impact you have? What what are you putting forth that's your big vision 
So we look at like, what's your big vision? How do you want to serve? We all answer that question first. Then what do you want for yourself personally, professionally, physically, financially, emotionally, because PR can open all of that up. So do you want to meet celebrities? So for her, she got invited to a celebrity charity um, where she was going to hobnob with celebrities. Um, and it was a cause close to her heart because it was money being raised for kids with chronic disease and um, ones that were, it was chronic disease and then ter terminal, terminal, so chronic or terminal. Um, and one of the things that we were talking about is like what physically, what prop can she bring to leave with people? And we were deciding on a, like a Lego of her, you know, as a doctor, because, you know, it was about kids. And so we, we had, and we batted around a bunch of different ideas and we decided, you know, on, on that one, because people will remember that. Okay, gonna so I have to stop you there because that's yeah. so interesting because, you know, one thing that I've been talking, I have a business partner that we have a, a program that we're doing and we talk about collaborations. He's from Nike, right? So Nike's all about partnerships. That's how they've built so much of their companies through partnerships. So what you just talked about is one of her intentions was to get invited to celebrity events, right? And so she used your services to help her do that. And so... Well, we didn't book the event, but the publicist booked the event. So I was helping her prep for the event. I'm like, got it. What, what do you say to the, how are you going to make, when, if, when you, when you meet the celebrity, what are you going to say? I'm like, well, we knew that um, Goldie Hawn was going to be there. I go, well, you know, research what is important to them. What about their kids? You can always, if this event is about kids, go research your kids, go research Kate Hudson. So you would have something to say to start a conversation that's deeper than just, you know, hi, how are you? It was like, you know what I'm saying? Like yes. I said, you need to do some research on these people that are there that you want to connect with too. Yes. So this is the same thing always. It's we're always doing research on people to, to especially the higher the level, right? Like even when I have a connection on LinkedIn, I have one later today. I try, I do all my background research before, I mean, we're talking about possibly collaborating. I don't know how that's going to turn out, but I've read the LinkedIn. I go to his website. I look at, I, you know, under, try to understand exactly what the business is and what's important to that person before I jump on the phone. So I have some starting point of connection. Okay. Are, yeah. are you all listening to this? Because I'm thinking of you as I'm asking these questions, because I think, it, so I know Susan has drop some gold nuggets that will help everyone who's listening to this. Okay. So Susan, then there's a third one. Did we cover, I don't think we covered the third um, myth, did we? Or, I'm sorry, not the third myth, the third um, component that we need when we are, before we go. So uh, positioning, proof and preparation. Okay. So we did cover all those. Good. Yeah. Okay. So one thing that I want to talk about a little bit more is the beginning when you go on to any type of media, whether it's TV or radio or podcast, and they ask you that first question, you talked about the story. And I will totally come out and say, the <laughs> first time I was asked this question, I went on for way too darn long. And it was when I went back and I listened to it after I learned more, I was like, oh, that's so embarrassing. They don't want to hear everything. So no, no, no. how do we keep it really tight? How do we know what to put in and weave a good story that hooks people from the very beginning and gets them to like us, want to listen? It's a tease, not a teaching. Mm -hmm. You are not teaching a class. Um, I was media training a, a man who was very successful in business uh, at a workshop. And he was like, he was used to speaking at the stage. And he's like, in the middle of the training, he's like, this is so friggin' hard. I don't know that I could do it because I was media training and they were going to be on camera and they needed to have everything um, down. And usually what, what we like to do is um, instead of, do, it's really hard in a workshop to be able to do that super quickly. So I like to have time, you, Majori, you, you and I have talked like months so you can practice in between. So you can start to get the feel of it and, and do some podcasts. And we, we look at the way, you know, what went well, what, what didn't go so well. And so you can iterate each time. So for the first time, you really need to practice the most condensed version. If we're talking about TV, it's the most condensed version. If it's podcast, it can be a little bit longer. It can be 45 seconds or a minute, maybe, but TV, it's going to be 20 seconds, maybe. So, you know, you want to have that story down 
to the nuggets. I just heard yesterday a, a guy who is just this amazing, he is a millennial who trains, uh, he, his podcast is about seven figure millennials. And a woman, he brought, he brought, he did a surprise thing. He said, um, Susan, are you up to, I'm going to bring like three people together and you're not going to know who they are. And we're going to like brainstorm for two hours. <laughs> and you know, are you up for that? I'm like, yeah, how are you up for that? Are you down for that? I'm like, yeah, I'm down for that. I'm like, and he said, I'm not going to tell you the format. I'm like, okay, I love a good surprise. So this woman um, gave a, a quite, he, he didn't have us, nobody knew what anybody else did. But he said, I'm going to ask you to tell a story. And in that story, we should be able to surmise what you do. But we also, they wrote down like three qualities of the person. Just write down the three qualities that, that you see in this person. But this one woman, I'm just going to tell the second half of her story because um, this, this is how you could set up a business. She said, my mother used to bake these wonderful ginger, gingerbread cookies, ginger cookies. And she always ate up all the crumbs and the broken ones and gave us the whole ones. And I asked her why she did that. And she said, because I want you to have the whole good cookie. And then here's her transition. We women in business uh, scrape up the crumbs and we leave the whole cookies for everyone else. And then she went on to say a statistic, you know, 81% of women earn less than $100,000. I changed that. So that would be the example of a story of why you do what you do, but it's it's a it's a story of something from her past that she she learned from her mother that she turned into an anecdote about her business, right? And then she would say, "I help women uh, scale their businesses and also sell them, exit them." You know, um, so great to... analogy. Yes, I love yeah. that. And we can all relate to that, right? Like we women, we're 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 like, oh yeah, you take the good cookie. Like, right. Take, take yeah. the crumb cookie. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just eat the, the crumbs. crumbs. Are okay. And how you know she related that to like financially. We're just we're snarfing up the crumbs and we're leaving the whole cookies to, on the table for, dare I say it, then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I or, know. Yeah. Or so the boy. Like it's not right? true. Yeah. What was that, Lene? It's not like it's not true. And it's men like, don't yeah. hate me. Love that you can do that. You can eat the whole oh, cookie, you know, yes. and let's spread, start spreading the cookies around and give them to women too. Like give your yeah. and neutral validated truth. Yeah. Like yeah. this, the stats are out there. It's so not... don't hate me. Just, you know, it's take just it the way it is. Yeah. To raise us all. Yeah. Okay. So really quick, I want to go into, I, I have a lot of clients that are writing books and, um, you and I have, Susan, you and I have talked extensively about this. So should you start marketing your book after you write it or before? Oh my God. No, you should start marketing writing your book when you're writing it. So talk to us about this. What okay. should be the plan as we are writing the book? To so when I was working plan? with Dr. Sarah Gottfried, who wrote The Hormone Cure and three other bestsellers, I think, or two other bestsellers. Um, one of the things we, she had, you know, she'd gotten a six figure book advance. She had an editor at her house uh, at the publishing house. And then she hired another editor. I was not the editor, but I read through all of her book and put in, she was making a transition out of, out of uh, practice into licensing and licensing um, products. And one of the things that I'd suggested to her is um, you're, you're ever, cause I was, I was doing part trade for my hormones too. And she would recommend supplements. And I'm like, well, what brand and what milligrams and stuff like that. And she had brands that she loved. I said, you should start to license those brands. You should start to license those brands. Um, we want to put in the book where you're transitioning to put those stories. I said, right now, all of your stories are based on your patients. I said, so if, if you don't want more patients, we shouldn't have stories like that in the book. We can have some, if you're transitioning out of one-to-one um, inpatient, in person, in patients, we need to start transitioning and put in your book what what you are the future that you're moving to. So it starts there. Then the second part of that is lining up all of your joint venture partners or how you're going to market the book. You start to plan that even before it's published because it takes a long time. To one of the things that she she and I worked on because at that time she was so busy 
she didn't have time to create joint ventureships. And I said, well, you need to make the time. She goes, I don't have time to talk to them or email. We, we created an email and I said, you need to talk to these people. They're high level. They're like Dr. Hyman and, and, you know, Marcy Shymoff. I mean, they were really big names. I said, you need to make the time to talk to these people. She did because for a book too, you have a very short amount of time to create a New York times bestseller. And there's a very prescribed, I don't know all, nobody does know all of the, um, the, the steps that you need to take, but we do know that it needs to be confined like to the first week or two, the maximum amount of sales and bulk sales don't count, but in a certain way they do. So you have to sell them in a certain way. So there's all of the strategy that we're going in to do that, to make the book a bestseller, but also to prove to the publisher, if you, if you're going with a traditional publisher, that that book has legs and that it can sell, and then they put more money behind it and help you with the promotion. So the promotion before into the book, the promotion with your launch, do you want to create joint venture partners for giveaways, you know, to increase the value of the book? That's typically the way that it's done. You know, we create like giveaways of your own things, but then giveaways from other people that's instantly downloadable, whether they get it from Amazon or wherever. So that's increasing the value of it. Then you you do your own promotion, right? Your podcasts and your webinars and uh, traditional media and social media. So one gal that um, I actually met her on LinkedIn and hopefully I'm going to be on our podcast. We keep missing, but she's accepted me on our podcast, but we haven't been able to book it. She um, put up something on LinkedIn like, oh my God, um, uh, uh, I forgot. Oh, she said, if anybody has ideas about book promotion, um, can they ping me? And I usually don't have time to do this, but I really liked her. And I thought, yeah, I've got a lot of ideas about how she can promote her book. And it was being put out by Harper Collins. So I wrote her and said, I've got a bunch of ideas. Do you want to jump on the phone for 10 minutes? Happy. And she pinged me back. We jumped on it that night. Well, what turned out was um, her book launch, because of the shortage of paper, had been pushed. She had done 60 podcasts, 60, 60 in preparation and had coordinated with every single one of them to not release the podcast until her book was released. So they had the date and her book launch was pushed by the publisher. Oh my God. Like you can't prepare for this kind of thing. Knew there's going to be a paper shortage. <laughs> right. Right. And that her book was going to be delayed and you know, all the people, she went back to everyone, but most of them couldn't delay it because yeah. they had their own schedule. So her book did make it to the New York Times bestseller list because she couldn't condense those sales, not from anything that she had planned. So sometimes our best laid plans, like Glennon Doyle, remember she had for her book Untamed, she had a whole book, book, you know, physical book tour planned. Oh my God. I mean, that took like a year to put into place. <sighs> so we need to plan for physical and online both and even the best laid plans so you want to have that webinar you want to have those podcasts you want to have your social media set up so if one of them falls through you know you still have a chance of reorganizing you know for the physical ones obviously like glenna doyle i mean all of those couldn't go online you know right they were those physical venues so we we do what we can but yes and so when you start actively if it's a traditional publisher you start to send galleys um, to get reviews um, six months out, typically. Um, if it's a non, if it's a self-published book, you, you don't get any reviews by traditional media. It doesn't mean that you can't get reviewed on blogs or and also, but traditional media won't review self-published books. A lot of people don't know that. The yeah. other thing to know about that, because a client just came to me, Midori, I don't know if you and I talked about this, but um, a new client just came to me and was not going to go with a traditional publisher because she realized that um, they own half the copyright. So they can dictate what you can put in a course. So I have a client right now, she's starting to write a book. I'm like, you got to create your course first. We're, we're creating a book proposal. I said, you need to create your, your course first because you own that and they can't take it. And then what goes into the book, then they can't dictate. Um, you dictate then what goes into the book in a different form. And it's going to be in a different form than the course. But you can't create, sell a book and then turn that into a course because you only own half that material. That I remember you telling me, and that was such an eye opener and such an important yeah. fact. You know, know, so yeah. again, all of this is regardless, a mo majority of what Susan just shared is whether you're self-publishing or it's getting published. And then also 
using the systems that you talked about, if you're self-publishing, that can help you get published for your next book, right? Because if you came out with a big fat launch. And Absolutely. You, One of my right? clients, Neil Dwosk in the Sedona Method, he self-published his first book because he has trainers all over the, the country and all over the world. And it did so well, it became a New York Times bestseller list, then the publishers came running, but he didn't want to sell that one to, to them in the US rights because he's making $25 per book versus $1.50. But what he did do was sell foreign rights because he didn't have as much of a hold in the foreign markets. So then you have leverage, you know, mm -hmm. when a publisher comes to you and go, you know, I'm not going to sell you US rights, but I'll sell you foreign rights. And so you can get the both best of both worlds. And you still might even consider at that point, if you've saturated with your people, you still might consider taking that deal, you know? Yeah. Because I mean, kind of an individual, you. Yes. you know, it, it, it's up to you to figure out if it's worth it financially or distribution wise, or what's, what's important to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I want to leave a few minutes. We could go on and on because there's so oh much gosh, to we're discuss. Almost at time. We're almost at time. <laughs> so I want to make sure we have time for questions, but I want to make yeah. sure we share the resources that you have been so wonderful to to offer our group. So tell us about this. So we have a consult and, you know, tell us what, what you have for us. And then we're going to open up for questions really quick. Okay, thank you. Thank you for remembering. So that's one of the things to remember. To remember to weave in is, uh, yeah. and hopefully when you've got a gracious host, they will remind you and podcast hosts will do this and TV hosts um, usually will um, talk about, you know, TV hosts actually usually direct you to their website because that's where they want you to go and your resources are up there. So for you, if you're interested in working with me personally, it's prsecrets.com forward slash joy spot. So PRSecrets.com is my website. So if you're interested in working together, we explore whether it's right or not. And if and if not, that's um, I'm very frank about letting you know. And then the second resource is the one that we talked about earlier is the resources. So that's PRSecrets.com forward slash Midori, M-I-D-O-R-I. And then the third one, I don't know if we put it into your um the original event, but that was the one where there's five templates. For, that you can do in five minutes. You, you do one of the templates in five minutes for your signature story. And that's prsecrets.com forward slash SIG pod, S-I-G-P-O-D, like signature story podcast. Okay. So I think I offered to your group just because everybody needs to have that in some way, shape or form. That is amazing. Okay. So we have a few questions here. Stacey okay. Joe, what are current trends in social media being used to promote that you like? The trends that I like in social media? Yeah. Is there anything that you're noticing? Um, I was just thinking about that in the shower. <laughs> because, you your mind. <laughs> I was thinking that in the shower, Stacey, because I just read a, a ping about how corporations are hiring Gen Z to run their social media. And my question, and this will be evident with time, is... How does that affect your brand and business overall? Meaning, if you connect with an influencer and she says, oh, you know, we've got this great book or whatever, and there's a rush on it because the influencer said it was great, but the people don't really resonate with it, whether it's an eyeshadow or a book or, you know, a cheese, whatever, or a service, whatever that is, are you really creating loyal followers? Because some people just go and do it and act really quickly. They buy the eyeshadow the one time, but they're not loyal to the brand. And it's the same thing with a book. So developing that brand loyalty is something that can be begun, I think, in social media with influencers or with a rush. But over time, I think time will tell whether that's effective. What is effective, I think, is when there's someone that you really resonate with, that really is in alignment with your values and alignment with what you stand for and what you're offering and can really do more of a deep dive, even if they just do it like one time. I mean, one time from Kim Kardashian can make you a millionaire, right? Um, 
But the question would be then, you know, do those people die over time, right? Like the same, the right. same question. Are they going to um, be supported? Yeah. yeah. So I think it's more about like resonance and that, and then creating a consistent campaign, consistency. It's so a persistence and consistent is something on social media that I think is really valuable. And Midori, that is how you found me. Not, I'm not, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you said, I saw you in three different places at once. And so I thought, and I'm like, where? And you're like, I don't really remember. It didn't matter. Yeah. It didn't matter. It It was that I saw you consistently. I saw you consistently. And oftentimes, um, so now it used to take like seven touches before somebody hired you. Now it's 10. Uh, or, or I've heard 20, 20, yeah. 20, 10 to 20. So when people come to me to hire me, or maybe they found me via SEO or LinkedIn. And I say, um, I ask them the question, how do you find me? Cause I want to know how my SEO is working. And then why, what inspired you to connect with me? And they'll say, I went to your website. I read your wa- raves. I read your testimonials. I watched your videos. I read your blog. So it's all of all those these components. Yeah. It's not just they originally got there somehow and they're like, I know that you were, I knew that you were right for me, but then they wanted to verify it and rightly so. That's why we need to have all those, those proof. pieces. Yes. Now I want to look at the touches and you want the yeah. touches where your people are. So Stacy, it's not like every social media, it's where are your people mm-hmm. and what effect do you want? Like if you want a super fast effect, TikTok, but are those your people? Are your, you know, are, are your, you know, are those, right you know, are in the age range and the people who are spending their time watching TikTok. Like most of us are in business. It's LinkedIn. People don't even have time. Obviously we put like lots of promotion out. People do not have time to attend this webinar live, sadly. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I want to let Lene, yeah. Yeah. So speaking of time, so I want to, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Lene has a question. And so I want to open it up for, go ahead, Lene. What were you going to ask? Quick question. I have expertise as social proof. I don't have a ton of followers. Um, and so as I'm publishing my book and, you know, probably self-publishing and doing my own launch, um, how important would it be to really invest in something like Amazon bestseller? Because New York bestseller is not going to have it. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do it. It's it's worthless to me. Sorry. It's been it's done so many times. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 that was over like ten years ago. <laughs> it was, and Amazon bestseller. I mean, I remember talking to one of my clients, and um, she she did become a New York Times bestseller, but she bought it. By the way, you can buy it. Don't do that either. It's a lot of money, and don't don't do it. And some people buy New York uh, Wall Street Journal. Um, that could be a little bit more valuable, but it's a lot of money. I think it was like thirty thousand to buy that. Yeah, New York Times bestseller. I think was a hundred thousand. But anyway. Um, she said, my book is an, an Amazon bestseller. I said, how many copies have you sold? She's like 50. I'm like, that's just a big lie. And, <laughs> you know, it's not a bestseller. 50 books does not a bestseller make. So people are putting that moniker on there and it's just BS. So and people know think, now. And people they do. Know most now. people, most people know. So the important thing is to start to build, it's not necessarily build a following. It's, it's to, to build devotion. So even a smaller e-zine list of people who are devoted to you is bigger than a bunch of social media people who are not engaging with you. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Oh my gosh. This has been, Susan, you know, I could go on and on with you for forever. I feel like we just scratched the surface. Oh my gosh. There's, I I haven't even asked you three fourths of the questions that I have here because it just flowed, but Thank you so much for being here and sharing your genius with us. There were so oh, many. Oh, thank you for those hearts. Nuggets. I didn't even know. I don't even know how to do that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> anyway. Yeah. I mean, just, it was, um, you hit on so many different things, regardless of what size your business is, where you are, what you're doing. It, it applies to so many different situations. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here with us and sharing with our group. I know there's a lot of people who can't wait to hear this after. Uh, So thank you.